Hey friends, I wanted to put a disclaimer on this video, because one, I value my life, and also, I just saw a cargo bob fly past my house while recording this, so it might be over for me already. This video is not terrorism, an attempt to incite terrorism, or an attempt to educate people on how to commit terrorist acts. This video is a 4chan user's story, in quotation marks, Someone who is pretending like he knows it all. A story from someone who may or may not be telling the truth and is simply attempting to educate people on the vulnerability of the US infrastructure system and a call to action for it to be fixed. Neither I nor the 4 channel in the video support these acts, support terrorism, or advocating for people to do the things mentioned in the video. I can't believe I have to say it, but do not do them. This video is simply to educate on the vulnerability of the US infrastructure and how it can be fixed. Thank you. If this video gets taken down or scrubbed from YouTube, you know it is all over for me. Pray, pray for me. <laughs> okay, let's go. Former cable worker here. I used to be the guy who hung telephone lines and fiber optic from telephone poles, buried them in the ground, installed power supplies and substations, you name it. All it would take to completely fuck the communications in an entire city is a normal flat head screwdriver, a pair of wire cutters, and a small flat head screwdriver. Maybe add a pair of bolt cutters to get rid of padlocks. Fiber optic is the easiest to sabotage. Just bend it until you hear it crack. And congratulations, you just fucked up a mile and a half of fiber. It will take them at least a day to figure out what the problem is and where it is. And if you crack the fiber right in the middle of a run, they can't just undo an expansion loop and cut off the damaged section. They then have to order the right fiber Different sizes are used, cut to the right length, and then hire a subcontractor to do an emergency job to install the new fiber, which is typically an all-day job. Once they're done, a splicer comes in to splice the new fiber into the network. At the very least, if you damage a fiber line, you're looking at two or three days with a line and everyone downstream of it has no service, plus tens of thousands of dollars in expense replacing it. Breaking the fiber near the can that it goes into, a laser repeater basically, is easy to fix. They just undo an expansion loop, stretch out the fiber, cut off the damaged section, and splice it. One day of work, max. Always break fiber in the middle of a run. Telephone and cable TV slash internet. Just open up the tap. Use the small screwdriver to back out the contact screws and close the tap up. With the screws backed out, the cable is not making contact and loses signal. They will spend all fucking day trying to figure out what the problem is. Note that they'll know exactly where it is until someone thinks to tighten the screw who just replaces the entire tap. This is nothing serious, but it is something that could be easily and quickly done over and over again to knock out service to a large area. Power supply cabinets. Use the big screwdriver to open the bicycle lock mechanism or use a bike lock key, but that does not always work. Then just unscrew the battery and unplug the batteries. If you really want it to be a dick, Cut off the padlock, open up the fuse panel, turn the fuse upside down, right side up is on, upside down is off, close it, and put a new padlock on it. Alternatively, just set off some homemade firmlight on top of the cabin, slightly off center, away from the end of the fuse panel, and it will fuck up the repeater and both batteries, as well as the cabinet itself, and they will have to replace the whole thing, which is an all-day job. And no, 
Most places, like major airports, hospitals, military bases, etc., do not have redundant communication lines. They get cable TV, phone service, internet, from a single provider, and that provider runs a single set of lines into whatever place they are servicing. One man, with basic tools, could be driving all over a major city and completely fuck his communications if he knew where to cut off the nodes. Just back out some screws, snip some connectors, and you just cut off all communications except for cell phones and radios. Cell phones you shut down by cutting the fiber optic that goes to the cell tower. Yeah, you didn't know that cell towers had cable and fiber, and that is how they connect to the internet and local phone service, did you? You can find the main lines running to the tower and destroy them, or take out the tower itself by shooting the transceivers with a high-powered rifle. Bam. That tower is not giving a signal anymore. Radio is easy to knock out. Build a spark gap generator, plug it into a power supply somewhere, and walk away. It is broadband, and it will keep transmitting on every frequency there is, and jam the signal within its radius. Set up a bunch of these all over town, and nobody is communicating via radio, police, military, fire department, EMS, nobody. It will jam cell phones too. Yes, they will triangulate their positions, especially if the military gets involved. This is why you need multiple jammers and get rid of them. But that takes time, especially the first time it happens, when nobody has any idea what the fuck is going on or whose responsibility it is to fix it. Half a dozen guys can, in a single day, completely fuck over comms in a major city and cause millions of dollars worth of damage and lost revenue with basic tools and spend nothing more than the gas that they use driving around. A couple hundred bucks at most if they build a couple dozen spark gap jenners to plant all over town. People have absolutely no idea how vulnerable our communications infrastructure is and you know the government's plan for defending said infrastructure? Hope nobody realizes just how vulnerable it is. No, seriously. That is the extent of their plan to prevent massive sabotage. Hope people are too stupid to realize how easy it is. Obama doesn't need to shut down the internet entirely. He just needs to block access for common folk. Wall Street and major corporations will still get service. You'll get a 502 error. So much business is done online that shutting down a city's internet for a day will cause millions of dollars of lost revenue. Easily. Not to mention, cost tens of thousands, possibly hundreds of thousands of dollars in expenses for the cable providers because they have to pay for replacement cable and fiber, hire contractors to install them, and pay emergency job rates, which are higher than the standard rate. Pay their own employees massive overtime, their all union, to splice everything in once the contractors replace the cable slash fiber, etc. You could easily fuck up the local economy to the tune of tens of millions of dollars in a single day. Do it to a city like New York, and you're getting into the billions. And while you're shutting down communications, why not shut down transportation too? Use a burner phone and call in bomb threats from major bridges, highway overpasses, etc. They shut down the roads. Cops scramble to search for bombs. Traffic jams from people being detoured from major roads and cause hours of gridlock, especially if you call in the threats at rush hour, etc. And the gridlock makes it harder for police and firefighters to get where they need to go especially once comms start getting fucked up. Want to shut down the airport? Call in a bomb threat there too. They'll ground the planes for hours. Fire an improvised mortar onto the tarmac slash runway. You don't need live rounds, just smoke bombs or even duds filled with sand. They have to treat every single one like a live bomb, and the airport is completely shut down. No planes in, 
no planes out until the bomb squad handles every single mortar round laying on the tarmac. And if the bomb squad is stuck in gridlock because they were across town investigating a bomb threat at an overpass and nobody can get hold of them because the phone and radio service is fucked up, you just shut down the airport for the rest of the day. Half a dozen guys tops could fuck over an entire city to the tune of hundreds of millions or even billions of dollars without hurting a single person or causing any permanent damage. And there is absolutely no plan in place to deal with this, other than burying our heads in the sand and hoping that nobody actually does it. The vulnerability of our infrastructure and the shittiness of its security is inexcusable. We really need to be building some redundancy into the system, upgrading our infrastructure and working out an actual plan for defending it, or else the Russians, Chinese, or the Wolverines are going to fuck everybody's shit up with near impunity. EE -E guy here. Let me tell you all about blackouts. Electricity is one of those things which industrialized society takes for granted. When we plug something into a wall socket or turn on a light switch, we simply expect, without a second thought, that something will happen. The electrical grid forms the backbone of all of our infrastructure. Water mains is operated by electric pumps. Gas is managed by a vast network of sensors and electrically controlled valves. And of course, computer systems, which encompass everything from the inventory and payment system you interact with when you buy your food and fuel, to the communication systems you are using to read this, rely on electricity. When the electrical grid fails, so does everything else. Most people like to assume that the electrical grid is incredibly robust and resistant to attacks. This could not be further from the truth. In 2003, 55 million people in the Northwest United States and Ontario lost power for two days. The cause of this outage was found to be a bug in a piece of monitoring software in an Ohio-based energy company's control room. The bug resulted in operators not adequately balancing loads on HV distribution lines, which resulted in them heating up from the extra load and drooping onto trees, shorting the lines and causing the load to be further shifted to other pieces of distribution infrastructure that continued to cause the failure to cascade, and within four hours, 55 million people were without power, and 256 power plants were offline after their automatic protection systems detected the growing grid fault. Now, as the cause of the failure was just some HV lines drooping onto trees, there was no real damage to the systems. However, restoring power isn't just a simple case of waiting until the HV lines cool down and then turning all of the power plants back on. The plants must be slowly added back to the grid, while at the same time also adding back load, as they often use induction generators, which actually need the system they are feeding into to be energized before they produce electricity. The reasons why they are used is that it simplifies the overall system, as it means each power plant inherently wants to output its power in phase with every other plant. In the event of a targeted attack against key pieces of electrical grid infrastructure, the resulting damage will take significantly longer to repair. Substations which take in HV and output lower voltages for distributions to parts of a city are probably the easiest target. Transformers are not 100% efficient. They actually produce significant amounts of heat and require the assembly to be basically bathed in transformer oil, which is nasty stuff for cooling. Should that oil leak out for some reason, such as a bunch of holes being shot into the housing or the drain plugs being opened, then the transformer will overheat quickly and cause permanent damage to itself and likely 
over nearby equipment. When one substation fails, the load is transferred to other substations, which if also attacked, will fail faster and more spectacularly. So now, the power has been knocked out to most major city centers, and the fix will likely take months to complete, even under ideal conditions. But why stop there? There are tens of thousands of miles of HV transmission lines, which are impossible to guard. The ceramic insulators, which suspend the cables to the pylons, are fragile and a complete pain in the ass to replace. Just a few people, armed with guns, could cause significant additional damage, which would also need to be repaired before power could be restored. A few hours shooting pylons can turn into weeks of repairs. You have just knocked out power to all major cities in your country. What now, you ask? Well, now nothing works. People can't buy food and fuel, which will quickly run out. Unless they have cash, they can't cook food, they have no water, and things will be this way for months. The government does not have the resources to handle such a situation, even if it was limited to just a few cities. Mass rioting and looting would quickly break out. People would be eating their neighbors by the end of the week, and the police and military would be quickly overwhelmed, trying to control it, even if they didn't have to also deal with a group of insurgents, causing more chaos. People like to go on about how if even 3% of American gun owners fought the government, they would outnumber the military and police, and subsequently be able to win. However, the truth is, you don't even need 0.1% of them to overthrow the government. It does not take a huge force to cripple the electricity grid, but the consequences are extreme. I am a cable guy. I sometimes find myself in some creepy places, both rural and urban. A particularly memorable experience will be getting lost in an underground maze of maintenance tunnels beneath several slummy apartment complexes. Detritus littered the floors. Light was piss poor at best. And no joke, someone spray painted, no eyes, always watches, all over a wall that looked out of place with the rest of the environment. It was like this fresh built cinder block wall that could not have been more than a year old. Looked pristine compared to the rest of the shitty tunnels. My jimmies were rustled. Could swear I heard strange, high pitched noises coming from behind the wall. I rationalized it as old machinery, but still, just felt like sharing. I tend to see weird shit from time to time. Any other service personnel with similar stories? Alright, how about the time I found myself in what was formerly an old school in the downtown ghetto part of the city that had recently been renovated into a community center and an apartment. The building was built sometime in the early 1900s and had two primary sections. A single story area that housed the cafeteria, gym, and other larger meeting rooms, and a three story section that housed more standardized classrooms. I suspect it was an addition around the mid 40s. Fast forward into the 80s, and the school was shut down and left abandoned for several years, before a revitalization project in the 2000s led to it being restored as a community center and as an apartment complex. The three story section where the apartments were located is where our story takes place. This was in the early months of my job, and I was riding with an experienced technician who has been with the company for nine years. He primarily handled calls for businesses and large-scale residential housing, apartments and such, hence are heading out to this location. As it turns out, the apartments had no tenants yet. The renovation had only been completed two weeks prior and not a single living soul inhabited the entire structure. Only one person had access, the property manager, a middle-aged woman who seemed normal enough. Certainly didn't strike me as crazy when we met with her 
outside the building. The work order of the day stated that the apartment's internet was constantly dropping in and out at various but consistent times of the day. This was all re-explained to us by the manager as she led us through several security doors that required key cards to open. Clearly, only those with the cards could enter the building, and since there were no tenants, the only person in the city with a card was the property manager. As it were, she, myself, and the other tech were the only free people in that building when this story took place. So, she walks us towards a stairwell in the back of the building. It leads down to a sub-level basement, and this is where the jimmies started to rustle. The upper floors were all pristine, welcoming, and generally appealing. But that descent, that sub-level, was freaky, and this was before anything even happened. As you descended the final flight of steps, the railing and the paint began to rust and flick. By the time you hit the bottom floor, it was like you had just traveled back in time 80 years, complete with all the wear, tear, and decay you would expect. Concrete slab floors, faded paint that was covered in smears of unidentifiable liquid, long abandoned classrooms with creepy children's drawings of distorted animals and people. Seriously, it was disturbing. Just imagine any of the old schools in Pripyat, abandoned, empty, but with art and drawings decaying on the walls. And the worst part was that the floors were not even. I don't mean little dips and bumps. I mean no two rooms were on the same level. When you stepped off the stairway, you were on a short, 15-foot hallway. To your left was a shallow, 5-foot ramp that dropped down about 2 feet and led to a series of rooms. And to your right was two steps, just two steps, leading up into a slightly elevated classroom with a tiny window in the corner, caked in dirt, casting a dull brown light throughout the room. The room area did not even have lighting. It was just pitch black. As me and the other tech explored the area, trying to find the building's modem, we pulled out our flashlights, and I noticed that the further into the darkness that we went, the more light from our LED lanterns seemed to be absorbed by the blackness. There was a point where I could hold my hand directly in front of my light, and my hand would not even be visible. I attributed this to mind games, but it still spooked me and the other tech, and it did not help that each room you either had to climb several steps or stumble down a short ramp. Eventually, we managed to find a single lit room on the far end of the dark series of ramp rooms that had the building's utilities, including our cable taps. We discovered that the modem's AC adapter was precariously loose from its socket, so we reseated it and secured it by zip-tying it to the sockets. As we were returning through the dark rooms, I got this weird feeling. Can't really describe what it was, but it made me want to move my ass and get on out of there. Can't quite put my finger on what it was, but I wanted to leave the underground ASAP. We took a wrong turn at some point, and actually ended up in a dead end. And due to the strange effects the black was having on our LEDs, it took a while to find our way back to the stairwell. And I shit you not, there was a fucking toilet. A goddamn porcelain throne, just fucking sitting there by the two-step room. It was not there before, I can guarantee it, and the other tech swears up and down that he did not see it on our way down either. At no point in our search of the downstairs did we discover a toilet, and I can also guarantee that we were the only two people on that floor, because the door leading to that stairwell emits a loud series of beeps, audible from any point on either the basement or the ground floor hallway. That was the point when we silently looked at each other and then bounded up the stairs as fast as we could. Nope. So we get to the office and we're talking to the manager, explaining to this lady about what was going on with the loose outlet and completely neglecting to mention any of the strange occurrences going on downstairs. She seems satisfied with our work and as we're grabbing our gear and preparing to leave, 
I kind of offhandedly say, it sure is kind of spooky down there, eh? And the manager just casually replies, yeah, this building is haunted. What the fuck, lady? The other tech and I just kind of glance at each other, and I can see his face paling. Mine probably was too. We look back to her. She proceeds to explain the entire history of the building, how it used to be an old school for ghetto children, had a lot of violent students from the rough surrounding neighborhoods. She said that every day, around either 10 a.m. or 1 p.m., she would hear the sounds of chairs scooting across the second floor rooms, where most of the classrooms for younger students were located. She is speaking as nonchalantly as can be about all of this, like it's just part of the workday. A woman, completely alone in a building, just casually mentioning that she hears non-existent furniture scooting around upstairs. A building which I can confirm had no furniture in it at the time to generate such phantom chair scoots. As she keeps explaining some of the other phenomena to us, my hairs start to stand on end. It was like my fight or flight was kicking in, because I really was not enjoying being in this place anymore. She told us how her boss was always calling her crazy about the stories, right up until she invited him and some other executives over for a meeting in her office one day, right around noon. During that meeting, the scoots occurred, and nobody ever gave her shit about it again nor did they ever come hold meetings at her property. The other tech tried to rationalize it as being some kind of pipework or ventilation in the ceiling, and she just kind of shrugs, grabs a broom in the corner, and pokes out some of the faux, removable ceiling tiles. Ain't jack shit up there. Not but for a single water pipe and a single ventilation duct. At this point, the other tech reins the conversation back in and starts to discuss the specifics of her service. I am still staring up at the ceiling, the hairs on my neck standing straight up, and then a nearby church started ringing its bells to signify the change of the hour, and then we heard it. It was a sound you heard every day in school for years, the sound of students excitedly getting up and pushing their desks and chairs as they were rushing out the door for a class change. It was as clear to the ears as these words are to your eyes. It sounded slightly off though, like the actual source of the audio was several feet above where the floor of the second floor was. Myself and the other tech, if we weren't pale enough before, went ghostly white. Even the lady got quiet and just kind of looked up at the ceiling. The sound subsided after a minute. I walked right out of her office, up the stairs to the second floor, and proceeded to look into every single room. There was not a single person, nor was there a single piece of furniture in any of those rooms. None of the eight units had anything whatsoever that could have caused what we heard that day. I just walked back to the office, politely thanked the lady for calling us, asked where the other tech had gone, found out he had left immediately after I had, and met up with him outside. We left for our next job and have not spoken about the experience at all since. Well, maybe he hasn't. A few days later, I was relaying my experiences to another technician, and after I was finished, he asked me the whereabouts of where this building was. After I relayed the general vicinity of its location, his eyes widened up, and he told me that he had gone to that school in one of its last years of operation, and that the place had been haunted back then. Students would report strange sights and feelings of unease down in the basements, and many of the grades of students who took classes on the second floor would deteriorate over the course of the semester. But that could easily be poor kids not giving a shit about math. You know how kids are these days. But to hear that over 40 years ago, people were having unexplainable experiences in that building certainly was an exciting find. It helped me justify that I was not crazy or overreacting, that the possibility that something paranormal may very well have been occurring in that building. From an objective standpoint, it could very well have simply been mind games and faulty ductwork. After all, 
the building had just had the upper levels freshly renovated, so everything was brand new and still breaking in stages of operation use. But I'll be damned if the sounds of chairs and death scooting was not coming from the whole goddamn second floor. And I still can't explain the light being seemingly absorbed by the blackness, especially with high power LED lanterns. Maybe an anon knows more about LEDs and zero visibility conditions than I do. But yeah, thought that was a fun little adventure, and it certainly whistled the hell out of my jimmies at the time. I am hoping to someday get another job at that location, so I can sneak in a camera and get some pictures of the creepy sublevels. Probably won't happen for a long time though. Hope this was a satisfactory read for y'all. I'm not the best storyteller.